In Austin, Texas, there were a series of brutal murders in the years of 1884 and 1885. The mystery remains unsolved. Today, we look at one of the first serial killers that operated in the United States known as the Servant Girl Annihilator. This is Red Web. Hello again, Task Force. It is Trevor Collins and Alfredo Diaz coming at you with a very, it's a pretty strongly worded name for this character. You, it, I felt like you dropped multiple bombs on me here. Yeah, um, yeah, hit me with one, it. One, Austin, Texas. That's where we're at. That's where we're at. Uh, two, the first serial the f- killer? The first, at least known. Known, right? right, yeah, exactly. Serial killer kind of patterns happening here, yeah. Wow. I didn't even think about like going back to the first one, like... Yeah, Never right. Well, my at least mind. in the U.S., right? Exactly. Where it's like, well, I mean, everything starts somewhere, somehow, and uh, yeah, sure, it might just be in the U.S., but it's still very intriguing to know. Um, and then the name, the oh yeah, servant girl annihilator. Annihilator just seems so extra. Jesus, like, yeah, who came up with this so brutal? Well, uh, maybe the we'll talk about uh, this. We're, let me break this down. We're going to talk okay. about some of the crimes, some of the victims, ending with the general patterns that were noticed. And then we'll move on to the general public reaction, the response to how all that went down. And then, of course, as always, with a true crime episode, we're going to the investigations yeah. and then the theories that purport to answer who this person was and maybe perhaps what they were after. One of the theories I think is very interesting. Ooh. And we did a whole episode on one of these characters. Oh. So, and they're going to crop back up here in the theories. I'll leave you with that a little titillating okay. I mean, piece of information. Right. I'll tell you whether or not I guess correctly. Um, it's just like what my mind is racing 50 different ways already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything you dropped on me. Right. But another thing that's coming to mind is what did this person do to gain that title? Exactly. Right? Like, and I'm, we'll dive into it. It's I'm a sure, pretty heavy like, title. That's a heft title right and so that's a good place to say as with most if not all true crime episodes you're going to have yourself your your trigger warnings for brutality here especially when you focus in on the the victims the pattern of who the victims were it's in the name servant girls so just want to give you a fair warning if uh, this isn't your beat don't worry about it we got plenty of other mysteries to cover for you and most of them aren't true crime if that's not your speed but let's talk about this case near and dear to the heart of Texas, Austin, Texas, the place that we are recording this show in now, the place we live, going back to the late 1800s to the United States' first serial killer. The night of December 30th, 1884, 25-year-old Molly Smith and her boyfriend Walter Spencer were attacked with an axe in their bed as they slept. The next morning, Smith's body was discovered outside her employer's home on what is now known as 6th Street where she worked as a cook. What? Oh, yeah. This is right in our backyard, baby. 6th Street, Dirty Six, that's with the, all the bars. That's the party street. Oh, baby. Oh, God. Never got cleaned up, huh? I first... You know what? I first... Yeah. She's still you never, You never would have known. <laughs> what do you mean? Jesus, Christian! <laughs> take, cake, take a walk down to 6th <laughs> yeah. this Thursday afternoon and tell me what you... It's see. very ratchet down there. Oh, you're, man. You're they, not wrong. They... There's some ratchet, and then they know how to party. They got everything in between, and I, you know, and for that reason, I love it. But I witnessed from afar, personally. Yeah, yeah. It is interesting because the first I had heard about this case was, I believe, not an Amy's ice cream, that's a pretty local fun joint, but it was like a frozen custard place across from the convention center. I haven't been there in a minute. Say, What's who, that place, Christian? Who the hell is telling you this at an ice cream shop? Uh, <laughs> so one of friends of mine. Because uh, <laughs> I believe that this was like one of the locations that one of these things oh went down. God. I'm like, you're telling me as I'm sucking down on some nice fro-yo looking at Where's Waldo pages right. that something went dirty down here. Like, ugh. Christian, do you remember that place that... Uh, Across from the convention center? Yeah, it's Froyo and in the counter there. It's like yeah, they have Christian, so... You know that place. You know that place. <laughs> There's so much... Here's the thing. They have I mean, so much Froyo accoutrement. Aficionado. It's like a Bennigan's. It's like a Ruby Tuesday's. It's got tons of crap all over the walls, tchotchkes. And then if you look in the table, they've got like just little like knickknacks and toys and stuff. And then there's a... Uh, an I spy list of like, can you find all the plastic cowboys? Can you find 13... The uh, horseshoes and it's yeah. all it's your favorite in... joint, Christine. Yeah, you you know we've <laughs> been there. My once. Hangout spot. <laughs> Dude, I am googling desperately. It is. A, it's like a, is it Barry? Hold on. Let me. I'm gonna go to maps. 
I looked up Froyo. I looked up ice cream. I looked up custard. <laughs> Imagine There's someone's nothing. like, "Here you go, little boy. Here's your ice cream cone <laughs> with ice cream scoop." By the way, did you know that? Was amazing? <laughs> did you know that on this site a hundred years ago? Okay, well, maybe I've dreamed it, or maybe they just closed down and they don't exist anymore. I swear, it used to be around here. Man, where was okay? Task force, whatever. I we. <laughs> There's we stop recording for a hot second just so we can look into this task force. This is where I have to activate your eyes and ears, people that know Austin. I know my girlfriend Barbara, Jeff. He would know. You're not thinking of, of like a, a TCBY, are you over by campus? I don't. I don't know, man. <laughs> you go inside. The place is like really small, dude. You can literally bring look this the man <laughs> inside the place, and he just go. I don't know, man. Like, maybe. I think this is it. There's so many things on the walls. There's like, no, no Froyo place is just littered with trash all over the walls. This place is. Dude, this man's lost his mind. <laughs> and all it took was a Froyo place. <laughs> Christian, I don't even know where you're from. But you don't even live in Austin. You guys aren't helping me out. Gaslighting me. It's going to keep Trevor up at night. Hold on. <laughs> not gonna be able I'm to sleep. calling Jeff. <laughs> now he's using a, a lifeline. Rope. I'm calling Jeff. <laughs> Jeff, my coworker, he's been in Austin for a long time. Jeff is not going to know. I pray Jeff's to God he's this. like, what Jeff's are you talking about? Like, I don't know. It's big. He forwarded me to voicemail. <laughs> I'm going to have to tweet this the moment it all comes to light. You guys are going to feel like such goobers. How am I going to feel like a goober? Wow, it existed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jeff like, look. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, and there it is. Yep, you proved us wrong. Listen, all I know is I stood on the footprint of a crime and I ate ice cream all over that place. <laughs> That's all that matters. That was the only point. Then we got distracted on closed <laughs> businesses. Place. <laughs> this place didn't survive quarantine. All right. So as a reminder, we got Molly Smith and Walter Spencer and, uh, you know, met an unfortunate end on December 30th, 1884. The next morning, her body was found on 6th Street where she used to work as a cook. Spencer survived the attack and a bloody axe was left behind. So Walter Spencer being the boyfriend. In March, servant women started reporting intruders entering their rooms at night, or at least attempting to enter their rooms at night. Sometimes they were attacked, but many times they survived their injuries. Five months later, on May 7th, 1885, yet another young African-American cook and a mother of three, Eliza Shelley, was found dead in the same room with her children. Jesus. Brutal. So these two crimes were connected by the targeted victims and the killer's weapon of choice, an axe. And at first, they were known as the Austin Axe Murders. Only a little after two weeks later, though, on May 23rd, Irene Cross was found murdered in her bed on East Linden Street. She was yet another young servant. So now we have three people murdered with a similar weapon in similar fashion. And then in between the first and second that are connected, you have a series of women in the same service industry experiencing potential break-ins, attempted break-ins, some accruing injury throughout that time period. So certainly an unsettling time yeah. to be in Austin, to say the least. I mean, like, just imagine there was a serial killer. Uh, uh, this sounds ridiculous, but like going after gamers. Yeah, man. I mean... Any any pattern just, that develops like that, right? You know, and and like if you just spooky. if you just fit into that pattern, it's right. just Like oh my goodness, right? Like it's just terrifying. Yeah, I mean, I on one hand, if if a pattern like that emerged, I don't know if I would feel, I don't know, like I don't know if it makes it better or worse in a morbid way. Because imagine if it was completely random. When random, we, you know, we right. talked about the Zodiac Killer, it was yeah. a very similar thing. Yeah, it was random at that at, sense. At, at that point, are you more? You mean right? Do Ooh. you take solitude in the fact that like now you'd be more aware and on? Right, guard, or does that throw you just for a loop and yeah. just terrified the whole Feels time? Feels like a rock in a hard place kind Oof. of situation. But yeah, I, I couldn't imagine like the way that they're feeling, and I'm very curious to see if there's any um, evidence or what the testimonials are like for the people right. that survived. Exactly. Too. I mean, yeah. it's it's interesting that you mentioned that because in the same year, we're still going through some of the cases here mm -hmm. in August. You have Clara Dick, who was attacked and luckily survived. So we have yet another person who, once again, fits the kind of pattern of this person. And, and we'll recap by talking about all these, you know, macro level patterns. But we have somebody else. You might have mentioned this already, yeah, but ahead. like, what are, 
What is the person attacking with? Like a knife? An axe. Oh, that's right. An axe. That's right. An axe. That's right, an axe. But right, I mean, it's because, interesting. Um, yeah. I mean, some of them will. What if your girlfriend, the girlfriend got attacked by an axe. Yeah. It is worth mentioning though, and I'm kind of jumping the gun. Some of these potential attached crimes involved a knife. So it is up for, you know, interpretation, I guess, if oh, this wow. person stuck with an axe or if they also used other weaponry. At the end of the month, though, on August 30th, an 11 year old girl. Mary Ramey and her mother Rebecca were attacked in their room. Jesus. Mary unfortunately did not survive and was found outside. Rebecca Ramey also worked as a servant where her and her daughter lived on Cedar Street. On September 28th, an African American couple, Gracie Vance and Orange Washington, were murdered in their home behind Gracie's employer's home on Guadalupe Street. These are all streets you drive around. These are all very common streets. These are all happening in around or bodies are being taken to their place of work so it's almost like whoever's perpetuating these crimes is basically saying it is specifically because of the work you do because Whoa, remember that the first body right. was brought back to the place of work outside that's insane yeah also very bold mm -hmm. so far it seems like they're targeting people of color so far, it seems like it's it's mostly women of color. There was also mm. Orange Washington, the husband, and also younger servant women. Is right. seems to be the kind of demographic, as it were. I mean, it also just seems like and anyone adjacent too, right? Because yeah. the children are getting hit as well. Oh God, yeah. that's brutal. So it's mm -hmm. just like, oh, you happen to be associated with this person. Um, cool. You're like. It's very sick, to say the least. This in awful. this situation, Sorry. the husband was involved, but in a previous situation, the other three kids were just left with the body. And and I'm not going to shy away from it. So again, trigger warning yeah. here. Gracie, when found, Gracie Vance, when found, was almost unrecognizable oh. from the attack. She had also had been dragged outside to a stable on the property. So Jeez. clearly whoever's doing this is doing it with great intent, and, yeah. a, and a vicious intent at that. Purposeful intent. Mm -hmm. And then on Christmas Eve, you have Sue Hancock, who was found in her backyard by her husband before midnight after a violent attack. And she would unfortunately pass away due to these injuries only a few days later. One more case I would like to talk about. Just an hour after Hancock was found, Eula Phillips's body was also discovered in her family's backyard in the wealthiest area of Austin at the time. Hancock and the Phillips were the first white victims and the last oh. known victims by the so-called servant girl annihilator. So, but also servants still. But also servants still. So, okay. in kind of wrapping it up, and if you were kind of skipping through some of the gruesome nature of those cases, let's just kind of wrap up the kind of observations that surround these these cases. The victims were all killed in the same brutal manner, unlike anyone had ever seen up until then. They were all in the middle of the night while the victims were sleeping, primarily with an axe to your question, but sometimes with a knife or an ice pick. Oh, Jesus Christ. Many of the attacks occurred on nights when the moon was full or at least very bright. That could be, you know, your so-called moon madness, or it could be just for the sake of being and able to lighting. see at night. You yeah. Know. The crimes seemed to grow more violent with each victim, and most were taken from their bedrooms to the outside after being... Um, in another trigger warning here, sexually assaulted. Oh my God. So yeah, these, uh, you know, these are pretty brutal cases happening here. I mean, I see why this person has the, the name that they have. Mm -hmm. That is, um, that is wild. Right. Um, and to take them to their place of work, take them outside or take them to their place of work. Right. Like it's a, it's a very charged in many ways act that's happening. Yeah, let's let's dive into kind of the Austinites' reaction around this, because as you can imagine, right, this I, going down. I mean, from one year to the next, it started December thirtieth, eighteen eighty four, and swung all the way up to Christmas Eve and Christmas time, eighteen eighty five, and then that seems to be the last case. I just, so there's a lot of intention here, is yeah, what I'm seeing. With how brutal everything was, I just and then you said Austinites, and I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot we're still in this still happened in Austin. Mm -hmm. I just. Could you imagine, like, being either the the police or the sheriff or whatever, and you're you're trained, you know what I mean, and, and you you have experiences, you take in other people's experiences, you read about other experiences, 
and then to see a murder and then another one done the same way then another then another like that's gonna set you back right to be that first i mean now you join the police force and you go okay there are serial killers but back then right i guess the mindset was like oh maybe there was one murder out of passion or one murder because this person was angry at that person etc and like people had they weren't some sort of like beef with each other someone would die and then that would end that kind of like line but then you see this where you go oh there's someone out there that's going to continuously right. do this and i don't know how many times right the pressure's on when where why right can you stop it can you figure it out before it happens again like all of that. that 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 first person trying to take that Ooh. on and and like like experience that for the first time must be insane yeah man i <sighs> Hats off. I I mean, to, mm-hmm. to the authorities at the time, especially yeah. considering, to your point, I mean, this hadn't been seen. Right. Especially in the Americas, but locally. Like, so you're just thinking of local Austin authorities just doing their thing. There's normally a pattern to, to everything that they have come to know. Yep. And then they're facing this. Right. Unprecedented. Yeah. Spooky times. So many Austinites around that time, given the fact that it happened at night, started dubbing the killer the Midnight Assassin because of how easily they slipped in and out of homes without being seen or heard. Citizens couldn't believe one person could do this, and they suspected that it must be an organized gang that was involved or that there was some other intent behind this. Because again, remember, you I mean, you said it well, that this is unprecedented. Right. So so, so they're looking for solutions. That this must be a, a, an organization. Of course it right, has to be. Right, organization. Who, or- what one person could do this or would want to? Or my mind would go like, how do they know each other? Are they a part of something? Right. Like, right? Where it's like maybe it's loose ends being tied up by an organization. True. But to be like, there's just one person, they've got like an MO and they're just following through on it. And it's just this is like, oh, okay, there's one sick bastard out there. Like Right. Ooh. Man, that's I'm just having like yeah. waves of empathy right now, because that's just like rough. But you know, and as we kind of covered most of the victims, in fact, the, the central entity, I mean, obviously there were surrounding the victims, right? The husbands and, and kids and whatnot. But really, at the end of the day, most of the victims were young African-American domestic servants and women at that. So they were also called the servant girl murders because of that nature. And the killer was the servant girl annihilator because of that and because of the brutality shown yeah. in these crimes. And this was a term coined by the author O. Henry in May of 1885. So the murders sparked fear in the growing Austin known then as the Athens of the South. And as a result of the crimes, neighborhood patrols began and the police force increased by 50 people. Wow. Doesn't sound like a lot. No, but I mean, back then, But it goes to show just how, you know. Just how smaller scale life was back then. Exactly. (laughs) 50 people. Now you might have a whole department that's 50 people. Yeah, Exactly. You'd have hundreds flooding the streets if there's something like that. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, we got 50. Beefed it up. Beefed it up a little bit. Now, another reaction that makes a lot of sense is that saloons started to close at midnight. There was a curfew at the same time saying, get home. For me, sunset would be curfew. If I can't see around a corner, I can't see out. Gone. You know what I mean? I'm just going to stay inside. Or or does that matter? I don't know. They're breaking into bedrooms, man. Yeah. I mean, you have a weapon at that point. So people coming to Austin from out of town were stopped by the police and sent away depending on their reasons for visiting. That was another thing that started happening, which is very safe to say. You know, you want to kind of filter the people coming in and out so you keep an idea of, are you involved with this? Is it someone outside the town? Is it someone inside the town? Some suggested lighting up the entire city. And in 1894, the famous moon towers were installed partially in response to the murders. So the moon towers, you have definitely seen but let me give you a little bit of Austin history. So the moon towers are these big, they almost look like antennas and they've been built around. So there's one kind of in the, the one I know is in the MLK neighborhood area. Mm-hmm. I've driven by that so many times and it looks like this little uh, antenna scaffolding, like a radio tower, but not as tall. And then at the top, at the top now, I believe there might be powered lights, but ori- originally it was supposed to be a light to capture and rediffuse moonlight back out onto the street. Oh, that's that that crazy. or or maybe I'm mis maybe I'm misremembering. I think it was basically to be a false moon. So as I mentioned, he, like it's got a scaffolding to it. We can post a photo on our Twitter page at Red Web Pod. But here's kind of like a look up it just for you, Fredo. It yeah. looks like the scaffolding of a radio tower. It's yeah, not it as does. tall. And then at the top. 
the reason why they call them moonlight towers is because they put a bunch of like high powered right. lamps and these are supposed to light up a full big area. And so it's kind of like a false moon, hence the name moon tower. There's still a few around to this day. I don't know if they're being lit up. I don't remember. And that was the reason why they were installed. It was partially the reason why they were installed 10 years that's, after this that's all true started. because I mean, it wouldn't be something it is. It, it seemed like it went up with haste, right? Mm-hmm. And at that point, I don't believe someone just went, we, we should construct this. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, this is probably something that people have been thinking about doing and adding in. And then they went, okay, now we need to accelerate that because. Yeah, it'll know, help it'll with help. situations like yeah. this. But to be fair, I mean, that was 1894. So nine to 10 years after this all kicked off, eight to nine years after it kind of resi- like subsided a little bit. But yeah, I mean, they're still kicking it. I don't know how many moon towers you'd need after having seen one to really blanket the land with light, but they didn't have enough. I'll just say that. Oh, because it continued? No, it wasn't that it continued. It's just I don't think that they are... They will definitely light up a big area, but just like Right, spots. but like how big is that, right? You yeah, know what I mean? And on top big. of that, like... Trees blocking what, it. Right, Street exactly. lights do more for, for exactly. lighting Exactly. I was about here. to be like, also, how do you get around the trees? Yeah. Like, but anyway, I mean, that is in part uh, one of the solutions, although it probably had other motives for those going up. But I would assume. But now that we kind of know the patterns and the reactions of the city, I want to talk about the investigations. Uh, obviously, then we'll move forward with the theories as to who this could have possibly been or what grouping it could have been. So at the time of the servant girl murders, the concept of a serial killer, as I mentioned, didn't really exist. It was very strange to the American people. There was not much in the way of a formal investigation. And of course, as we've established in many episodes prior, no DNA testing at this time. Yep. Sniffing dogs were used to find suspects and police tried to identify footprints and shoe prints near the bodies. However, it appeared that the killer removed their shoes before attacking, likely to create less noise and or evade the police. Um curious to know what like uh i mean i guess like the victim scent they'd give to the dogs and then the dogs would trace down the victim scent if it was still lingering yeah I, it's uh right? unless, unless you found a piece of clothing that you thought wasn't the victims was, and you it, could be it, like right but yeah i mean you you maybe have them get a sense of the scene and then see if they can't chase it down anywhere else beyond the scene it's one of the few tactics i mean they had especially yeah. when normally they diagnosed after the fact caught somebody and put right. him away to prevent I mean, further. the minute you said sexual assault, my mind went to, okay, DNA, no, nope, not, not yet. Right. Not mm-hmm. yet. Um, we're not there yet. Not so. there yet. Yeah, I mean, we talked about, I mean, I've talked about this. We've talked about this a lot in terms of just like, I couldn't imagine how much easier it, was, it would be to get away with stuff during those, like, the further right. back you go, right? Like, right. Taking advantage of trustworthy people that don't lock their doors in a time yeah. where this kind of thing doesn't happen. It takes no. a very um, ill and mind to exactly. conceive. But you, you um, do it and it's like, why well, you don't leave any footprints? You don't leave well, here's any traces? The thing. Like, no shoe prints. Took the took the shoes off to, right, to be silent. But then the thing is, still- sometimes there were bloody footprints left at the scene. Oh. And that gives you the ability to maybe, if you can find suspects, maybe compare foot sizes, maybe compare toe prints but who knows if they're actually going right. to be able to see i don't know when when fingerprints really came on the scene like, show me your toes give me those toes <laughs> um another thing though that often happened or sometimes happened was that the the weapon would be left behind what the and again this is f- certainly before Whoa. dna and fingerprint testing yeah because you'd never leave that behind these right. days like <laughs> right. someone was like the murderer left the weapon behind like i don't need this anymore maybe you have the dog sniff it down and say like Maybe. Smells like mothballs. Chase this down to my grandma's attic. <laughs> you know? Like, what? Mothballs. Moth- you know the smell of mothballs, but you don't know what mothballs are? I'm sure you know the smell. Everyone knows the smell. Christian, what's a mothball? They're, uh, they're like... Like a cheese uh, puff? How'd you, how'd you just- I mean, I wouldn't mean it. <laughs> Essentially, they're like how these you really it? potent smelling... They're, uh, they're little pellets that, you know, the reason why they're attributed to the, to the elderly a lot is because moths... Certain kind of moths would eat fabric. And so if you wanted to chase those moths away, you'd load up like your wedding dress and a bunch of other old clothes in a trunk with mothballs, hence the smell in the clothes. So that way it would scare away. It's kind of like to discourage moths from eating their clothes and nice oh, things. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, like little little pellets kind yeah. of. Yeah. Yeah. To prevent moths from, yeah, like chewing on, chewing holes through clothes and yep. stuff like that. Yeah. Eating huh. your silkware and whatnot. Yeah. 
But um, yeah, I mean, so maybe the dogs were sniffing down those like axes and who right. knows? Try you know? anything, anything. Try everything. Another wrinkle, though, to the, to these investigations, as you can imagine, is that police investigation records were not always kept. Not that they were kept well or kept poorly. They were just not always kept. It was a simpler time those yeah. days. And with filing and like, eh, you yeah, didn't right. have the ease Down of access of electronics and stuff. Yeah, no, it's yeah. a lot of things are done manually. Mm-hmm. But all of that said, there were some similarities between cases that definitely assisted with the search for the person who would be called by the reporters the Midnight Assassin, right? Obviously, they're understanding that there are trends between the victims, the locations, the way the crime was handled and taken out. And so from that, they were able to maybe start building a bit of a profile of who they were looking for. Many Austin residents and the police force, remember, this is late 1800s, not va validating the way they went about this, but this is the fact of the matter. These, the folks at the time in reacting to this just assumed, due to the nature of the victims, assumed it was just an African-American man that was perpetuating these crimes. Mm. Or they assumed that it was some sort of infighting with the African-American community to deal with. A lot of baked-in problems there. Yep. And as you can imagine, when Eula Phillips and Sue Hancock were killed, much more attention began being placed on the case. I bet there was. Yep. Very charged topic right there. I'm not going to steer into it too much, but as you can tell, the people at the time were a little, uh, a little more passive on it until right. their white neighbors until began white neighbors and, yeah, being and involved. Like, Wait, hold on, this person's out here killing white people. Like, we got to figure this out now. Th now that yeah. yeah, yeah. So the police force seemed unable to find the killer, obviously. So the mayor, John Robertson, hired a private detective agency from Houston to help, though they were also unable to solve the case. The partners of the women who were murdered were some of the main suspects, as you would imagine in, in many crimes right. of this nature. So you have Walter Spencer, the partner of the first victim, Molly Smith, who was arrested in December of 1885 after two days was then finally acquitted. Eula Phillips's husband was also convicted as a, quote, copycat killer because of Eula's alleged infidelity. Uh, so that would have been his motive, apparently. Right. Though he had some injuries from the attack as well, and people had a hard time kind of getting by the fact that if he was attacking somebody, would he injure himself to feign, you know, innocence, or was he also attacked? That I mean, kind of this wasn't out during that time, but you know, you pull a scream one situation there. It's true. You know, you got two people exactly. as one person. Yeah. So despite having those injuries though from the attack as well, despite kind of them being allegedly on fidelity and allegedly a copycat killer, he was in fact imprisoned for six months before being released. Uh, it seems like in that day you just arrested the person that you were most suspicious of. Um, yeah. That's, I mean, since, yeah, the what do you do when people are, are being killed? I mean, I suppose yeah. you jump on it, but... Jump on it. I mean, look, I... Messy, but... You know, you take uh, color out of the picture, right? It, it's not... If you're in a panic to try and figure this out and you're just like, these are suspects, do you lock them up? Maybe you go, okay, that's a way to test to see if, if they stop. They stopped or mm -hmm. anything. Granted, I'd do a house arrest or something like that. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> something um, way lighter. Um, right, because you don't want to violate rights. And it, then, and exactly. But then also, if it's an organization, does it still continue? Yeah. Does that get that person like, back but out? I mean, like, these are unprecedented times. So you kind of just try and figure it out as you go along. Yeah. And kind of continuing with this trend was Sue Hancock's husband, who was also arrested. The only difference here is after the attack, he wasn't, he didn't have any injuries, unlike Phillips did. But there was a letter written by Sue, and I have another trigger warning here, that spoke of her husband as abusive. But her daughter, or their daughter, I should say, argued that he was not the killer, and he was subsequently acquitted and released. So... Definitely gets a little muddy. Definitely, you know, some other problems surfacing. It's right. hard to tell if any of them were or were not guilty. That's a whole nother like investigation. In itself, Absolutely. Though. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're specifically trying to lock someone up for these murders. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, they were as as they should be desperate to find the perpetrator of these crimes. Yeah. And in the end, about 400 men were arrested Holy during 1885 
Yeah. In relation to these murders. 400? Yeah. Okay, they were just locking up anybody. That's like a person a day. Holy plus some. hell, dude. And it didn't stop. Uh, not until, I mean, not until the final one or two crimes there in December of 1885. Um, and that's a question of, did it stop because someone was arrested? Answer, no, because no one, by the end of all of this, even to this day, no one has ever been definitively connected to these crimes. Oh, man. You gotta yeah. think that, like, that's a button you don't want to press, which is locking up a ton of people. But you like to think that if you do press that button it, it gets you somewhere you know what i mean you'd hope right you if you're gonna go to that length you'd yeah. hope that you, you know it's a uh what is it it's like a glass the planet thing it's like a it's salt right. the earth it's like it just a blanket move to try to stop something even more right. heinous from happening it's like a, it's a big hugely messed up move but you know you go okay lesser of two evils mm-hmm Hello, the task force. How are you guys doing? Uh, just wanted to speak a little bit more to the cryptid pin set and the hoodie that I mentioned earlier in the episode. They are planned for February 15th. The hoodie may get delayed just due to shipment challenges that are out of our control. We just can't uh, control the whole world. And if we could, you know we would. And we would make you bring us all the Cheetos and Double Stuff Oreos. Thank you very much. But yeah, keep an eye out. We'll let you know on Twitter if that does get delayed. Otherwise, they're going to be there at store.roosterteeth.com, just like we promised. And uh, and then you can represent the task force in the, all those different ways that you do. Also, something that might be new to a lot of you in the task force is RTX. That's a convention that the company that we work for, Rooster Teeth, holds every year. And this year, with all the safety and health precautions possible, we are finally able to do it live in person again. That will be happening July 1st through 3rd in this year of 2022 and we would love to see you in person. We have so many different panels on all the different content that we make. We'll probably have some behind the scenes of Red Web. You can come ask us questions, probably do a task force annual meetup like we did last year at the Digital RTX. It's always a good time. It's one of the favorite things I get to do in this job is finally meet you all in person, talk about what we're doing in the content, whether it be here on Red Web or over at the other part of my job at Achievement Hunter. But yeah, you can get those tickets at rtxevent.com. They are all there ready for you now, and uh, and I really look forward to seeing you. But with that said, I want to talk about some of the fantastic sponsors that make this show possible. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by Babbel. It's that time of the year for setting new goals. Top of my list is to continue learning a new language. That's right. I have been able to speak at a kindergarten level, Christian, in French. So if you ever have a toddler that speaks French, you can have them come my way and I can talk about colors, shapes, and sizes. Uh, and I'm doing it all with Babbel. Babbel gives you bite-sized language lessons that you can use in the real world. That's why I'm actually using Babbel, so that way I can... Uh, it's, it's, it's more fun. It's kind of addictive the way they gamify learning language. It's not memorizing cards and words and conjugations of verbs. It actually has made me feel a lot more confident in my ability to speak French, which... Uh, is, is something that I like to do at home with my girlfriend. We know just a little bit of French now, but uh, thanks to Babbel, I am learning a lot more. Other language learning apps, I should say, use AI for their lesson plans, but Babbel, those lessons were created by over 100 language learning experts, so you know you're going to get the good stuff. Babbel lets you choose from 14 different languages, including the usuals like French and Spanish, but then there's also uh, a little bit more fringe ones that aren't as common on other apps, such as Russian, Turkish, or Indonesian. Plus, their speech recognition tech helps you improve your pronunciation and accent. So right now, when you purchase a three-month subscription to Babbel, you'll also get an additional three free months with your subscription. That's six whole months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use our promo code of RedWeb. That's B-A-B-B-E-L.com. Use code RedWeb. Babbel, language for life. This episode of Red Web is also sponsored by The Jordan Harbinger Show. Want more podcasts to dive into conspiracy theories, cults, and scams? Not to mention unique stories of extraordinary experiences? Well, look no further than The Jordan Harbinger Show. Jordan interviews people with fascinating stories and specialized knowledge. We're talking North Korean defectors, actual spies, and even FBI interrogators. The show also covers topics far beyond those. Jordan's archives of episodes include technology stories like deep fakes, telepathy, and preventing a superbug epidemic. I'm looking around right now and I feel like that is very timely. 
Ultimately, he's done episodes in all kinds of topics, in experimental psychology, and just all different walks of life. So if you're interested, you know, Jordan's a great interviewer, and he's able to pull insights out of his tremendous guests, and they're both entertaining as well as informative. So if you like that combination of what we do here on this show, I think you're going to like what you have over there at the Jordan Harbinger Show as well. Check out jordanharbinger.com slash start for some episode recommendations or search The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And with that said, let's get right back into the mystery. But that's essentially, I mean, you know, we've got, we've talked about a few true crime cases like this. The Zodiac Killer, you know, Jack the Ripper, and then there's a couple others that are eluding me in this moment, but a handful of cases like this, and, uh, some have more information than others. It's just, I think, the due to the nature of this one being in late 1800s, that's pretty much what we know about this case. Damn. And uh, like I said, again, no person has ever been definitively attached or attributed to these crimes. Right, and, so they uh, just got away with it. Got away. Whew. So let's talk about some of the theories, um, the people behind this case, uh, or perhaps any groups behind this case. Now, before we get into the theories, though, it is worth mentioning that this, again, happened years before H.H. H. Holmes or Jack the Ripper or what have you, other cases similar to this. And despite that, despite being kind of the first of that nature, the servant girl murders passed into obscurity, especially compared to something like Jack the Ripper, which is right. much more well known. It's much more infamous. Yeah, in that I mean, sense. I've never heard of this at all. Yeah. Yeah. Modern researchers, though, have essentially reignited the interests and the investigations into this case. I love that. Well, yeah, why wouldn't you take right. modern day gadgets and just right. theories and the new way techniques? You, yeah, reapply and then them. Apply that. Yeah, I mean, it's worked out for cases in the recent decades. Why not yeah. recent century? One of the more famous examples is the author of the book Midnight Assassin, named Skip Hollinsworth, who goes into pretty good depth about this, but. Despite all the ongoing investigations now today, looking into what went down and trying to uncover more information, there are some theories out there as to who the killer could be. And I mean, they're as good as they can be based on the information known. So let's talk about the first case. So the first theory I want to talk about revolves around the idea of voodoo. Um, this theory essentially addresses it in, in a in the organized group setting rather than saying it was an individual. Right. There, it's kind of a loose finger point at the idea of voodoo. Now, I've seen voodoo in pop culture a lot. I know right. a, like a criminally small amount about voodoo. So I want to kind of read a little bit from Wikipedia about what it says, a conglomerate of information. Yeah, it because, me you know, I want to, I want to, you know, give some some credence to what's going on here. So voodoo is a religion that originated in West Africa and has many subsets that have spread throughout the world, including the United States, most famously in Louisiana. It is regarded as a diasporic religion, you know, a religion of peoples that have been displaced. And on a macro level, and this is where I want to quote Wikipedia, quote, voodoo cosmology centers around the voodoo spirits and other elements of divine essence that govern the earth, a hierarchy that range in power from major deities governing the forces of nature and human society to the spirits of individual streams, trees, and rocks, as well as dozens of ethnic voodoo defenders of a certain clan, tribe, or nation. Essentially, patterns of worship follow various dialects, spirits, practices, and songs, and rituals. Specifically, regarding the Louisiana branch of voodoo, if you will, there are four phases to a voodoo ritual, all identifiable by the song being sung. You have the preparation, the invocation, the possession, and the farewell. And so with that very quick up to speed kind of information dump, I want to get back kind of to where the theory is coming from. So a lot of the older African-American residents of Austin at the time theorized that the killer was involved with voodoo. And the reason why they kind of think is, is because they perpetuated these crimes consistently without being caught. And they even theorized that because of their powers within voodoo, that they were able to become invisible, to escape being caught and to be able to silently break into places. Yeah. I think it, and it's interesting in the fact that like, right, this is a time where there was a lot of racism. Sure. Um, a lot of lack of understanding. Exactly. Of one another. Yeah. And um, 
to think that there are also people of color that are like, well, maybe it's not, you know, this person going on this racist spree. Maybe it's, you know, another person of color Mm -hmm. using voodoo in order to, you know, kind of like complete whatever they want. Right. Whatever motives they had behind this crime. Yeah. Yeah. Another reason why the African-American community in the area started thinking that, too, is it was something they were more familiar with, of course, but also the fact that this person or persons were able to enter residences at night without being noticed, Mm -hmm. especially when some of these residences had dogs that were kept outside. Oh. Uh, Not necessarily as watchdogs, but certainly would act like one if somebody unfamiliar at the middle of the night woke them up, busting into a place. The fact that these dogs and the people, the residences, didn't notice them slip by is another reason why they thought that voodoo tactics were being used to almost stifle their footsteps, not only to be silent, but become invisible, to basically lower their profile in a certain way. And the reason why I wanted to give some background on voodoo is because, you know, there's a lot of, it's used a lot as a a a, a plot device in pop culture. And so I wanted to give it its due, you know, credence on some background and that this this theory isn't just coming out of misunderstanding and just coming out of the woodwork. There is some, you know, mysticism to it. Mm-hmm. It is a religion of magical and mystical practices, right? But within those realms, and for those who believe in its power, that's where this theory kind of comes from. Uh, it's very interesting, especially given that it is in the South and in the late 1800s. But it's just, I think it's another natural attempt to solve something that is so dark, so sinister, and so... Like, why would anyone do this? This is yeah. literally the first crime of its style. So people are just kind of like, like what? what is happening? How do we, yeah. Right. How do we put this into a category? Right. And right. When it feels like the category doesn't exist mm-hmm. yet. Right. So that's the theory, number one. I don't think these next two theories actually preclude it from, ex- from being a part of it, but they aren't mentioned. So let's move on to theory number two. The second theory now that I want to talk about is the one I was kind of teasing at the beginning. So before I get into it, there was a a very similar case to this that we've discussed in a previous episode, and I've mentioned two of them now, but what was your guess at at the top of this episode that that this person um, could have been? Jack the Ripper. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's where we're headed. Oh, is it? Theory two is that this was actually Jack the Ripper, or at least the same person, the same unknown person. Uh, like this that, was like their true beginning. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because, I mean, Jack the Ripper, a lot of those cases, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly, was in London, right? In England. Yes. And so this would have had to revolve around somebody who could make it back and forth. Because then there's other theories, just jumping back to Jack the Ripper, that they did what they did there and the murder stopped in England because then they came to the new, new world and continued them here or lived out their oh. life, with them, you know, here. So this kind of throws a little wrench in that idea, but, you know, some people still theorize that the Servant Girl Annihilator and Jack the Ripper are one and the same. Both go after females. Yeah, it's true. You know, both violently attacked lower class women in the middle of the night. uh, And the Christmas Eve victims seem similar to the night when Jack the Ripper attacked two women within 45 minutes in different areas while evading any witnesses. It's the same kind of way of handling it i guess right the technique one, yeah in a sense it's like boom something happened slip through the city unseen quietly to somebody else boom another crime happens what is the year difference between the two it's a very good question because the jack the ripper murders happened in Whitechapel, a district of london in 18 wait for it 88 oh three years Ooh. after these ones went down giving you ample time to if you were to do something Travel, like this set up get situated American, yep get familiar with a place oh man it's an interesting theory oh yeah it's very interesting i how else to escape the pattern than to just leave they're like this is a pattern that never has happened right i'm gonna establish this pattern and then i'm gonna leave yeah and then i'm gone and then i'm gonna do it again because i'm a sick ill person jack the ripper oh man that is so interesting and then they escape back to maybe the Americas as a, as a as right a to theory. familiar land and so then suddenly you have all these like your past is just cut off every time you transfer countries like in these days your paper trails just man burned. that is in you can make up your own history it's, I'm Harold Boyson it's not a crazy theory it is not it is not 
So, I mean, especially with some of the similar occurrences and, and the trends in the victims and all of that. So to reiterate, I mean, these servant girl murders ended only two years before the Whitechapel murders began. So, I mean, it's possible, man. That's super possible. And then it also kind of continues to shrink the pool of people capable because, I mean, at that time to move back and forth like that right. would, would cost you a pretty penny. It costs you money. So we have servant girls being attacked, servant girls being, you know, tend to serve people at restaurants in, in some sense, but also serve the wealthier people. And so then you start to build a case for, is there a wealthy individual here that has a huge gripe with this you know, so to speak, lower class grouping of people that they take it out on them and then they flee the scene and kind of do a similar thing in London. Man, that's spooky in a Dude, way. Dude, it is. I mean, back then, man, if, I'm just saying, hypothetically speaking, if that was the case, it's just how crazy and how easy it, it was back then to just do something as, uh, as over the top like that and then just get away with it go somewhere else do it again like yeah nutty it's wild i like that theory a lot yeah well there's a sub theory within this two oh. sub theories in oh, fact okay one is about a man by the name of maurice he was one of the suspects of those many 400 and he was a malaysian cook at the time only known as maurice he worked at the pearl house a place which almost all of the victims lived nearby so essentially, this is establishing a familiar ground. If if he's kind of, that's that's something for the police to do. They want to figure out right. is there a commonality between all these places. And a Maurice, lot of times you go with what's familiar because right. especially if you're doing something as extreme as this, you want some sort of comfort and mm -hmm. you know the area. sense of like you like you know the beats, you know the repetitions and the motions yeah. of yeah the places and the people. But he's also working in this industry, and he's also in striking distance from a lot of these you know locations where the crimes happened. And soon after the murders, guess what? What? Maurice moved to London. Oh! And then in November oh, of 18... Damn. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Look, it most likely is not, but it's just... Oh, poor Maurice spi getting thrown it under the bus. It is a spicy theory. It is very. And so in November of 1888, the Austin American statesman reported on Jack the Ripper and compared it to the servant girl murders. And they theorized that Maurice moved to London to evade detection and to continue his alleged crimes. So even in that moment, when the Jack the Ripper crimes were still happening, the servant girl crimes were fresh on the mind, people at that time were already theorizing this very thing. Yeah, during those times. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Another sub-theory revolves around Jack Maybrick, who was another suspect for the Jack the Ripper, and author Shirley Harrison theorized that Maybrick was the individual behind all this because of his traveling work as a cotton merchant. Not much else to be said about this individual other than the potential, right? Right. Locations their, and times. Their, their job allows them to mm -hmm. actually travel. But man. Their alibi. You're right in that Maurice might have just, it just might have been unfortunate. I'm sure you could find a lot of people Damn, that moved from Austin right. yeah, to Yeah, that, that traveled over there and, and whatnot, but, but boy. Woo. Boy. That'd be insane. Oh, yeah. If, like, oh, man, just connecting such, two, like, two big moments in time like that. Mm-hmm. And connecting it to one person. Oof. I mean, it's only natural when this is the essentially the first and second crime spree of its caliber, He's, of its exactly. type. Exactly. You're just going, it's got to be the same person. You hope it's the same person because right. it, clearly it's factually happening. It, and you hope that it's not... <laughs> A new more epidemic. and more people, or yeah, right. right. Don't be given those ideas. But I mean, we've lived a few more decades than them, and we've seen that yes, more people are willing to do it now. So I don't know. Let's move on to the third theory revolving around Nathan Elgin. This theory stems from a PBS show, History Detectives and James Galloway of UT Austin. They actually introduced Nathan Elgin as a suspect. So Elgin was born and raised in Austin and might have known the city very well and possibly knew where to evade detection. He was 19 years old at the time of the murders, and in early 1886, Elgin dragged a woman out of a bar and was subsequently shot by police, and he died the very next day. 1886. 
Remember, these crimes ended at the end of the year 1885, and it is possible that his death is why these murders ended. Oh. That maybe he was caught in broad daylight doing something similar yeah. to his crimes, and that the police, for lack of, uh, I don't know, just given the situation, decided to take him out, and, and then, then the stopped. crimes ended. Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, I... God, I feel like there's so many people you could look at during that time where it's like, oh, oh they no. passed away. Maybe it stopped or yeah. they moved. So maybe it was them. Yeah. I mean, so far that's coincidental. But this next piece of information is just, I mean, it's definitely coincidental. But man, if it ain't some sort of smoking gun of some, you know, it just, oh, okay. it whiffs, man. It's got a whiff. I mean, you're using the so, terminology of smoking gun. Yeah, that's, that's a big one. I mean, on you tell show. me. You tell me. I don't want to vilify somebody on coincidence but yeah now this man's died now they can take a look of him top to bottom they notice that this guy's got four toes on one foot well wouldn't you know it but the footprints that they found at some of the crime scenes had a very similar four toe pattern meaning that either this guy's missing the same toe or he's done himself in by taking off his shoes to be silent left some bloody footprints and that missing toe is the same missing toe, you know? It's pretty that's what I'm saying. It's pretty massive. But here's the thing. Nowadays you can't you can't just say that and be like, yeah, they're the bad guy. Cause like, you know, it's totally possible in the late 1800s to be missing a toe from gangrene or something. But I don't know. It's been chalked up to as coincidence. Yeah. And I will I will leave it as factually that. But to me. It's it's just I guess I'm desperate for a solution. I'm this, desperate for yeah. an answer, given the nature the of everything. Same toe from gangrene. Oh, that's yeah. I like. You know, you, do you ever wonder how and you don't how many toes have been lost to history because of like ingrown toenails or someone you know picking at their toenails oh, and it right. like snags, just, bleeds, and gets infected, and then they yeah. lose that whole foot. Just because medicine wasn't um, right as uh, updated back then as it is right. Now. Yep. Now we got the liberty to just hack at our toes. <laughs> Just get in there with toe knife and just dig away. <laughs> we got our own little man. Life is beautiful. Oh, oh. but well, imagine um, what it's like in like two hundred years, where modern medicine got would toe be lasers. Time. You got toe lasers. You got toenail LASIK. God, I wish you could just lay in a pod and then you'd have doctor would pull up like a kind of like a um a menu three D wiring of like your body and, and just shift through the layers and. If there's anything that's bothering you, they could just... You don't get in a pod. They, they go... Beep, 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 beep. Well, the, they scan the, you with a highly doing, radioactive gun thing. The pod is doing the work. <laughs> the pod is in, <laughs> is all encompassing with the radiation. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. As I can see, mm -hmm, I just scanned you, and it seems that you've taken a huge dose of radiation. Uh, would you... Sir, was it the pod? <laughs> no, 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 no. Couldn't be. Would you live 50 years, but in perfect health and, like... And then kaput? And then kaput. Because say it, that was the trade-off for the medicine, right? Yeah, I'd rather live 50 strong years than 50 yeah. blah years. That's the question. Well, I mean, like, not saying your years are going to be blah. Oh, you I'm say just I'm saying die just, at the age of 50? No, no, no. What I'm saying is at the age of 50, you die because of all the radiation that kept you, like, nah. like clean slate in terms of, like, you know. If I, if I had a different back, family. Your back's history. not giving you issues. Right, you, There's right. no, like, uh, cancer came up. It, it's able to cut off nah. cancer, but the radiation essentially gave you until 50 nah, that's or not naturally live balance. until like 80 or 100. Yeah, naturally, maybe. I'm, that's not a good payoff. That's so, why I say 50 because I was no. like, 50 might be enough. Christian, you live until 50? What's that? Perfect health, living until 50. Like to the age of 50? The age of 50, uh -huh. but like say modern medicine is able to keep you... Tell a 25-year-old they're over the head. <laughs> Tell yeah. me how it goes. Yeah. A midlife crisis at 26. Yeah. Like, that's, <laughs> like that's modern, so modern medicine uh, is able to keep you in perfect condition. No deterioration, no injuries, no, no, no problem. But well, it the, poisons you with but, radiation. But, <laughs> right. There's the radiation poisoning, and so you would die around 50 years old. Or just naturally this live until like 80. Yeah, versus like just what... Is naturally now. living I would interview the yeah, person like that says I'll take that deal but yeah, then again nah, I mean it depends nah. on your family history I mean also like it, you know the, the, the 50s guaranteed but then just depending on how well you take care of yourself and your, your day to day life like I'd rather take that and just 
Live yeah, eat your healthily. green beans. Yeah. <laughs> and I can well, live these beyond These are saying, drink your milk, <laughs> yeah. eat, eat, eat your some veggies. vegetables, do some workouts. And then you That's don't got to worry about 50. Here's the thing. I don't think equipment of that caliber would be allowed. Would no, be it would not be allowed at all. Yeah. So. Well, what was, there was an article recently about the, um, there's like pods. Are you talking about like in Switzerland or whatever? Yeah. Those that, assisted suicide pods? Yeah. Yeah. I mean. That's a whole different conversation. <laughs> a whole different thing. Whole different thing. But yeah, eventually medicine's gonna be you don't need to lay in a pod and scan yourself. You just have like biometric clothing, a watch, maybe a chip implant that sucks your blood a little bit periodically. Inject me with nanobots. Let them go in and just You ever read the book Prey by Michael Crichton? No. Ooh. It's interesting. It's about nanobots. <laughs> oh, it's, it's about nanobots that basically rapidly evolved and become like a hive mind with one another and they oh god can like move around in a swarm and, oh uh, god yeah I and mean, that's so that you can control people that's skynet Ooh. all right well task force you know what i'll leave you with that question would you oh. live to 50 perfectly fine no arthritis no, no. bad back no, no thrown ma- you got There's wolverine healing so many young people right now they're just like no way. They're like, I'm already like that. Yeah. Well, life is amazing. Life is amazing. And then you have people that are like in their 40s going, oh, mm. <laughs> <And then laughs> you have people, like, what's life after 50 look like? Yeah, you know? what's for me? Come on. Like, <laughs> I don't what's, know. What's 30 more years, maybe, really? <laughs> I get. I, I bet like 10% of the people would be like. Majority, yeah. I don't think would. No way. I think it's a big chunk of your life taken away. Yeah, for sure. But anyway, this is uh, kind of the wrap up to this servant girl annihilator. A very morbid case, very intriguing case, Visceral. kind of being an Austin local now. Yeah. Um, Wild though. I, I, you know, it's intriguing from a lot of angles. Yeah, one, being the first one. Of being this guy. the first one, Ooh. and then uh, the location. Yeah. And then the icing on the cake is just the theories tying you to Jack the Ripper. Oh yeah. Like that is that came out of left field, and yeah. I was like, I was like, oh man, like. Uh, maybe there's yeah i guess there's a theory of jack the ripper or whatnot and then there's a couple things that kind of make it line up and i go oh that is spicy yeah i mean it's it's very morbid but it's also morbidly like it drives a morbid curiosity in me and and part of it is also just the desire for closure on something yeah. this dark but you know as always it's just one of those cases we may never know the ending of no um, i mean even if you do Right. If what do you? It, yeah. It, 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 it was the person passed away by now? Right. Like, right. <laughs> like, it's tough, but uh, but that has been the Servant Girl Annihilator Task Force. Thank you as always for listening. Did you know? By the way, Fredo, you can uh, Task Force can give us a five star review on Spotify. I didn't know you could review on Spotify now, I but you can either. But I was told that we were being flooded with five star reviews, yeah. and we cannot thank you guys enough. Yeah, this little thing we started during this quarantine from a distance mm-hmm. has become this task force. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, we, we've got a lot of ideas on the docket. You know, I think we're going to do a live show. Our our company here, Rooster Teeth, is doing a podcast tour. And obviously we're part of that. So, you know, stay in tune sometime this this year. We're I think we're aiming uh, for sometime around October. Yeah. Just due to the nature of Halloween and whatnot. But, you know, we're going to try to come to a city near you guys. So honestly, the more you listen, the more it tell, it, it's polling the data. We've looked at right. the data and we're looking at which cities listen the most. Because this yeah. is kind of a test because to see if this works out, if we can right. do more of these. So, so that's another way. If you thank want, thank you for the love and support. And yeah. like Trevor said, we're looking to like how we expand it and how we do this in video form, make bigger, better things, mm-hmm. and maybe see the task force in person. So keep an eye out. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. 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 I just Bigfoot coming at you from behind. Wow. Well, well, keep an eye out. Stay see, nimble, with task force. That would that would be unfortunate. But in my mind, I'm thinking like. We're going to have to go somewhere spooky again at some oh, yeah. point, aren't we? Aren't oh, yeah. we? Aren't we? We're going to dive it's into just kind of naturally where this show takes us, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Task Force, Fredo, see you back here on Monday. Oh.